Hey everybody, Casey Ferris here. I make videos on DaVinci Resolve here on YouTube. And today we are talking about color management with our good friend, Daria. How's it going, Daria? It's going great. Yay. Daria, if you don't know, she actually wrote the book on color correction, you know, the black magic book, but it's fine. So Daria, I'm really excited to talk about color management because this is something that I've sort of ignored for a little bit. And I kind of hate to say that so that I don't look like some hack, you know, but Honestly, it's it's really intimidating and I feel like I can get good results without color management because I mean, I've been color correcting stuff for like years without it and it seems like it works fine. So can you give us a little intro on just what color management is and why it's useful? So it's a pretty broad question, uh, but I'll try my best. Sure. So as you're probably well aware, uh, different cameras uh, shoot in different color spaces or different color standards. So for example, consumer cameras, um, you know, things like uh, smartphones or, you know, the consumer like um, camcorders that you can get tend to capture things that are ready for viewing, you know, so they're rich in saturation and contrast, you know, they're pretty much like ready to show your friends and family. Prosumer cameras or slightly more, you know, advanced or professional cameras tend to assume that you're not just going to be ready to view this footage right away. They assume that you want to process it a little bit, maybe spruce it up, you know, usually it, make it like more pretty. So instead of capturing colors and light the way it looks in reality, they instead try to capture uh, footage with like a bit of a, a tonal lean uh, known as, you know, a log curve that allows to preserve much more light data or luminance data within the image. And that mm. gives us a lot more latitude for grading and preserving detail. And then you have like the super professional cameras that capture raw, which don't even bother, you know, applying any kind of log curve, but instead just capture several stops worth of light and allow you to play with those after you've already captured the footage instead of doing it in camera. Mm. So there's a lot of different ways of capturing media, uh, you know, and a lot of different color spaces in which it can be represented, uh, even at, at just a starting stage. Another um, sort of stage that we have to consider is the deliverables, which also have a range of color standards. So you have like Rec 709 uh, for broadcast television, but then you have uh, another standard for cinema projectors, which are able to display a different range of colors, a wider um, gamut. And then finally, you have, I suppose, like more advanced signals like HDR, for example, like Rec 2020 or Rec 2100. What I'm saying with all this is that there's a ton of different color uh, standards, a lot of different ways of capturing and representing uh, color and luminance. And uh, one way that we can sort of simplify things for ourselves is by having a project color managed, you know, uh, under the hood, so to speak. And that's what the settings in DaVinci Resolve allow us to do, uh, the color management project settings. It allows us to remap our starting point, our footage, into a certain standard that we can work in and then deliver that into another standard, our deliverable. Uh, so all in the background doing it for us. And it also like allows us to preserve maximum signal integrity all the way throughout. It's a way to take different cameras that shoot and they all look different basically and kind of bring them into the same space and make them look good somewhat automatically. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So if I had to describe the benefits like in, in threefold, number one is what you just described. So being able to work with multiple camera types, um, mm -hmm. multiple types of footage and have them all pretty much rerouted into the same working uh, color space, you know, so they're all the tools are operating predictably uh, on the color page. Number two would be that it also allows you to deliver uh, multiple project standards. So let's say you finished editing your film and now you want to send it to Sundance, uh, but then you also want to send it to television, you know, after it gets picked up or approved or whatever. And then finally, you want to edit a trailer for YouTube. Instead of having to create a brand new project for every one of those deliverables, you can just change your output color space and send it to those uh, different standards. Finally, uh, I would say the third benefit with the latest version of Resolve is that it also now allows us to work with certain ultra wide gamut uh, color working spaces or color standards. So ACES has been around for quite a few versions, but now we also have the DaVinci wide gamut, which is starting to extend beyond the visible representation of color or light, which means that it's allowing us to future proof our projects. It means that we can now color grade our media with the anticipation that maybe in 2030, there might be a new color space standard introduced, something beyond HDR. And we will be able to open up an old project and simply re 
map it to this new standard wow. uh, that will always be smaller than the DaVinci wide gamut and deliver to that. Man, that's, that's crazy. So it's like taking all of the colors that exist and putting it into a big bucket and then taking whatever you need for whatever screen you're delivering to out of that, that bucket of colors. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can think of it as like resizing images, you know, in an image editor. So you start with like a gigantic poster size and then you can turn it into a postcard or you can turn it into like a, an A4 piece of paper, et cetera, you know, you just like yeah. resize it to smaller. So you're never losing quality basically when you're doing it that way, you know, from a wider gamut. That sounds really powerful. I mean, because usually you look at footage and it's only just a slice of what you can see, you know, something's overexposed, something's underexposed or whatever. And this is capturing as much as the camera can capture in raw let's say the biggest range that you could take, but it's basically keeping all of that range throughout post-production and letting you pick a part of it, like at the very end of your pipeline. Is that right? I don't know if you'd keep a part of it, you'd remap it essentially. Okay. So you're still preserving the whole signal. You're just kind of like downscaling it to the available color space that you have. Sure. Yeah. It's not like you have to clip stuff, but it's like something that is, you know, way too bright for you to normally see you can turn that into just the brightest thing that you can display, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. The background processes right now, we have the, like the display render transform controls, which will automatically roll off your highlights and the shadows, right? So you're never really gonna see things that are like ultra overexposed in your viewer anymore. Everything will be rolled into your viewable range. So if you're working on a 100 nit monitor, which most of us are, like a computer monitor, then um, it will already look good to your eyes. And you're not gonna have to like worry with like that whole step of, pulling down the highlights, you know, either with the curves or with like the gamut mapping uh, open effects. Um, you can just basically have all the under the hood processes taking care of that. And then when you output, like you said, you know, it could be output to HDR, which is capable of displaying much brighter whites, or you can output it to just standard broadcast television or YouTube, and that will just remap to those available standards. Okay, well, we got to jump in and look at this because, I, you know, I it sounds like we're living in the future and I, I'd like, I'd like some of that. Okay. So here we are in resolve 17 in the color page. We have a whole bunch of different shots here. Most of these are shot on black magic raw. There's a couple that are shot on a DJI. Here's one shot on a red. Normally I would look at something like this and I would probably, you know, go to the camera raw stuff and maybe fix any problems, but then I'd go over and start doing my color correction just in the primaries wheels or maybe the HDR wheels. So how is the workflow different when you're using color management? The process doesn't have to be too different if you don't want it to be. You could, for example, use color management purely as a means of future proofing your project. So if you prefer to grade from log color spaces, for example, you're absolutely welcome to. But you could also choose to remap this media into a more like a viewer friendly color standard like Rec 709 and just, you know, get a jump start on the contrast and saturation and start grading off that. But okay. it's not going to clip your video video data in the way that, you know, transforming to Rec. 709 usually does, you know, during transcoding. So it will still give you full access to all the raw data that's within the signal. So this sounds kind of like what you would use a LUT for at this, at this point. A little bit. The benefit of working with color management is that you're still working in a 32-bit floating point space. So it's pretty much like limitless uh, latitude for color grading. Unlimited latitude. Unlimited. <laughs> Whereas with LUTs or lookup tables, there's tables of values, tables of data that you are transforming from and to. So you are still limited by the amount of values that you have. And if it's below 32 bit floating point, which usually LUTs are, they're usually like, I think, tap out at 12 bit, you know, feel free to correct me, uh, which means that there is a possibility of some of your values being like not necessarily clipped because that implies that only the top part of like the waveform is going to be affected yeah but it's more about your colors just being averaged you know so that if there's you know with a raw signal for example there's going to be a lot of data there so eventually once you reach the limit to the amount of values that a lot can represent it's just going to start going for the closest possible value you know sure it's limiting the amount of processing it can really do yeah with a lot but where this it's based on math rather than looking up a sample, right? Exactly. Okay. So if we are going to use color management to make these shots look good, mm -hmm. what would we do first? First, let's jump into the project settings. Okay. 
and we'll have to go to color management on the left-hand side. All right, so the way to enable uh, color management is simply to set your color science from DaVinci YRGB, which is the display referred, okay. to color managed, which will then be scene referred, which means that you are now the one to communicate color information to Resolve as opposed to Resolve deciding for you. Gotcha. So color management now is reading the majority of your video data and determining the input color space based on things like internal metadata, based on like the container type. But you have the ability to overwrite that if you want. Yeah, so, so you can go to custom and... Exactly. And so you have all these all controls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what's really nice about the presets is that uh, they pretty much represent the best of the best settings for those specific uh, standards. So whenever you select one of them, you'll see a short description underneath saying, hey, this is good for, you know, broadcast, for example, or mm -hmm. streaming. So you've got like all the most popular standards already in that list. And then beneath that, you have your output color space, which is determining both your viewing environment or monitoring environment and your deliverable standard. So let's say, uh, you know, you had a grading monitor, then you could choose the standard that you are capable of viewing. Wow. If you're color grading on a computer screen, again, then you probably want to stick to Rec. 709.24, maybe uh, Gamma 2.2 if you're in an uncontrolled uh, lighting environment. If you're on an Apple monitor, mm -hmm. then you might want to go for sRGB for, to match its internal uh, color space. Okay. And the idea is that, you know, as you deliver uh, different versions of your project, all you have to do is change the output color space to match that standard. Wow. Now that... The general rule here, though, is you want to start with the widest uh, possible color standard and work your way down. So previously, I used that analogy of, you know, working on, say, an image, like designing a poster. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had to design a poster for the side of a building, but then the campaign would also run in, I don't know, magazines or flyers and things like that. Yeah. You would probably start with the largest version of the file and then scale it down. You wouldn't begin with, like, this postcard size image and then scale exactly. it up for yeah. the building because then you end up like, you know, yeah. macro blocking. Um, so that's the idea with the color spaces is you want to choose the widest gamut uh, for your first delivery and then work your way down. Okay. So what would you, what would you choose then? I mean, if, if this is something that maybe could be like, I mean, if you're working on a short film, let's say, you want to actually show this in a theater of some sort, would you pick P3 first? If I had the ability to monitor P3, I would. Okay. Otherwise, I might want to leave that to, yeah, Rec. 709 as is. I've got like a Flanders that I've got set to Gamma 2.4. But what would be more important is changing my Resolve Color Management preset to match the P3 standard. Gotcha. So now I'm working, yeah, in that wider. So yeah, broadcast or cinema for projection. Okay. Um, I believe that would set it to D60, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So really, it's like right here, you just kind of pick what you're planning on doing. Yeah, essentially, yeah. You determine your project working space, and then the output is basically where you're setting up your deliverables as you start to render them. Yeah, because you can change this later. It's not really a big deal, right? Exactly. You can change output at any time. It won't really affect the project, but you do not want to change that preset mid-project. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine. No. So tell me about DaVinci Wide Gamut. So the DaVinci Wide Gamut is an ultra wide gamut that's been introduced in DaVinci Resolve 17, in which you can actually see how much uh, color the gamut can represent. And you'll see that it extends beyond you know, the visible representation of color on the CIE 1931 graph, which means that um, if you start working in a project in the DaVinci Wide Gamut, you're uh, future proofing it uh, for foreseeable monitoring and projection standards. Like if you don't really know what it's going to be and you want it like to be the most future proof, would you just pick DaVinci wide gamut here? Yeah, absolutely. Like, is there a disadvantage to just picking that versus the other ones? I suppose the only disadvantage I've seen so far is people who are used to working in a certain standard, like let's say Rec. 709, mm -hmm. they might feel that that latitude is sort of affecting the way that uh, the color page tools perform. So they might just not be used to some of the controls uh, that they might see in you know, the primaries or the HDR palette uh, or the curves. Gotcha. So if you know that you're delivering in Rec. 709 and you're used to working in it, then you may as well just stick to Rec. 709. There's no kind of need, I suppose, to expand the gamut. So far, I've been doing everything in, in wide gamut, and I've been very happy uh, with the results. Okay. So let's say if we switch to that, and our output space is gamma 2.4, so that's just like a normal monitor, mm -hmm. we'd set it something like this. Would we do anything else? You're pretty much good to go. Um, if you click OK to confirm, you can now go into the color page 
and you'll see a shift uh, in the footage in the viewer. Uh, oh yeah, it looks great. So there's Man. already been like a yeah, slight change. So the good news, by the way, is that for all the raw clips that you have, their color space is automatically detected by DaVinci Resolve and it's automatically remapped. Yeah, that's why they look look pretty good, you know? Yeah. Wow, that's really neat. Uh, but then you can also, for further accuracy, go into the clips that are not raw and start to adjust their individual input color space to make sure that the transform is accurate. Yeah. So these clips, these were shot on Blackmagic, but the, these aren't raw. These are transcoded. So how would I do that? Anything that's been transcoded, it's not able to read, you know, the original yeah, color space. Yeah, that makes space. sense. It, it has no idea what it is. <laughs> right. Just... So you're going to need to right click the clip or clips and choose input color space and then choose it from this list. It seems like it's pretty important to know that <laughs> if you're going to do it this way. Yes, absolutely. So if you're going to be using uh, Resolve Color Management, oh, that looks nice, then you should be fairly confident about what standard the footage was shot in. Best way to find out sometimes is to contact the DP uh, mm -hmm. or whoever gave you the footage and say, hey, can you tell me anything about the camera or, you know, the colors that this was shot in, the color standard. But if you have no way of finding out, so sometimes I work with archive footage and I just don't know. I could just bypass it all together and grade it like the old school style. Okay. So there's a couple of ways you can bypass color management. Number one is if you right click and you go into input color space. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can see that at the top underneath the project settings, you have bypass. Okay. Now doing it this way will mean that the clip is still part of the color management pipeline. So it will still be affected whenever you change your output color space. Gotcha. And that's probably the ideal way to do it. In fact, right now it looks really good because uh, uh, Resolve was able to read the starting point of this footage. So it already looks nice and contrasted and saturated. But then you also have the additional option of bypassing color management altogether in a clip. And it's also in the right click contextual menu. So you could see, yeah, just bypass the oh, downside bypass of management. Oh, okay. That's so it. then that, that just comes in as log then. Exactly. That, that just completely switches off the process. But the downside is that you're now going to have to kind of keep an eye on this clip. And if you change your deliverable standard, yeah. this clip won't be affected. So it's not ideal. Yeah. So it, it kind of gets rid of the advantages of that, which I guess is still better. I mean, because you might have to go back and do a, a trim on like one clip, you know, or one scene versus the entire movie. But yeah, okay. I prefer to just bypass the input color space as opposed to the overall color management and it still looks pretty good. So what does that do then? How does that know what adjustments to make? All right. So we're now seeing the effect of the DRT, the display render transform happening in the background. If you go back into uh, project settings, okay, you are now ready to graduate into the custom uh, settings. Ooh, oh, uh, look at us go. <laughs> we're doing it. Okay. So once you've set up your preset, once you click custom, you unpack that preset. So we're still in DaVinci Wide Gamut, mm -hmm. but we're now seeing uh, all the background processes. So right now the input color space is set to Rec 709. But remember, if you're working with raw media, it is able to read and determine its own input color space. So it will overwrite whatever you've set up there. Sure. Okay. Most of the time, if I'm working with multimedia projects, I just set my input color space to bypass. And I will set up individual color management on the clips on the timeline. Okay. But then more importantly, you have the timeline color space, also known as the, the project working color space. And you'll see the white gamut represents the color. The intermediate is the tonal distribution or the, the working luminance. Okay. And then underneath that, you have the timeline working luminance, which I also find very useful uh, if you're working with a raw media with like several stops of light, you know, in an image, mm -hmm. the kind of stuff that you usually have to fix with gamut mapping or with, you know, reducing like maybe the gain or mm -hmm. the top of the custom curve. The timeline working luminance will do that for you. It will assume a very high dynamic range, right, of the brightness, and it will automatically kind of roll it off for you, roll off the highlights. Uh, so you get like a nice gentle slope into the 100 nit range that you're currently outputting to. Yeah. Uh, so so that... this is really what's yeah protecting that. But what's remapping the tonal ranges, which is what you were asking about a second ago, is the input and output DRTs at the very bottom. Okay. So right now they're both set to DaVinci, but there's a few other like um, standards or like algorithms that you can use to perform that mapping. Okay. Uh, da DaVinci is the recommended setting because it tends to be the most intuitive. It's able to read uh, the tonal map of an image and remap it in order to create consistent behavior across the timeline, no matter what type of footage you're working with, even if you're working with mixed types like HDR and SDR. So then you kind of end up with similar distribution in your waveform 
which means that the tools operate similarly in the color page and the contrast looks very similar. Okay. It's like automatically just trying to color correct it basically. Is, am I understanding yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's looking at the waveform and it's redistributing it based on whatever the input is. It's either stretching it out to fill, you know, your scope's height. So it's almost like the auto color kind of thing. Yeah. I suppose it is like a mathematical mm -hmm. operation, except it doesn't affect color. It only affects tonal distribution. So really it's doing its best to kind of give you a good result anyway, if you bypass the input color space on something that you, you just don't know the, the input for or isn't raw. Exactly. It just tries to spread it pretty evenly across your scope. So if you look at the waveform right now, you can see that it, it's pretty much filling it from black to white. Yeah, gotcha. Pressure. Yeah, yeah so this is bypassed. So then it's just stretched it out in the scopes from yeah. black point to white point. It's not as good as the one that like I can pick, like this one. I feel like that looks maybe a little better. It's a little flatter, but it still does a pretty good job. It still exactly. definitely takes away a lot of the work that I would be doing, you know, doing just a primary on it. Yeah. If you had like a whole bunch of log media in there, that would be automatically distributed, you know, which will create contrast, you know, via that kind of distribution. And the advantage is that it, it does it non-destructively, right? So it's not like clipping stuff out like you would if you just threw a LUT on something. Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. And because of uh, like the latitude of the um, the wide gamut, like the working space, it's really difficult to like clip or destroy anything unless you start to get funny with, you know, the intricacies of the waveform itself and you start to like maybe be aggressive with your contrast or stuff like that. Man. So this comes in just completely clipped at the top. So this was shot a bit hot. Uh, so you can address that with the raw palette. Yeah. And, and then also adjust it with the HDR palette as well or any of the other primaries. Do I have to take the ISO down or can I just bring it? Well, now that you have highlight recovery enabled, you should be able to yeah, just drag the waveform down with the primaries and yeah, you should see that data come back. Oh, it's not uh, still coming. No, no, it's the I ISO actually, yeah. The, I always get confused with this stuff. I'm, I'm like, where do I need to do the first one? But yeah, if you take there, that down, yeah, I guess it was clipped anyway. That That's what it was anyway. I think, it, th yeah, this particular clip, it's a bit intense. Yeah. It's not throwing away information. You can still get to it through the various palettes, which I think that was always what I was scared about when it comes to color management. When I feel like I started seeing tutorials on ACES and stuff like that, I, I was like, man, why would I do that? Like, why would I automatically put a preset on everything that's going to ruin half of my stuff? That just seems bad. <laughs> like the more I work with this, the more I'm like, well, actually like a lot of this, I mean, for the primary, it's like, 80 or 90% there, it does most of the primary for you. And then you can just go on and kind of fix problems with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like the hard values that are being transformed or clipped in any way. So you still have access to the original signal at every stage of the workflow. Yeah. If you really feel like it's ruining something, you could bypass it, right? Like Absolutely. Yeah. You can just go to input color space, bypass. <laughs> and it's like... It's gone brighter. <laughs> or you could turn it off, right? Bypass color management. Altogether, and then yeah. just work with the log footage. So worst case yeah. is you feel like you just can't work with it. It ruins something and then you can just bypass it. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to touch on is the tools work a little different when color management is on. Is that right? Yes. The HDR palette, notably, uh, was designed to work with uh, Resolve's color management enabled. And in particular, it was designed for the wide gamut. One thing that you're going to see that's different is the global wheel now pinches the signal at both the black point and the white point. Oh, yeah. Now, what's wonderful, it means is that you never see clipping right in the black point or the white. Yeah. Uh, even though, of course, if you drag it far enough, it will kind sure. of perceptually I mean, start to look white. It looks overexposed, but it's not like it's crunchy like, like it can be. So that's good behavior, not just for the exposure, but I find for a lot of the other global controls in the HDR palette. So for example, saturation will now be focused to like the mid ranges as opposed to affecting, you know, the white point or the black point. Oh yeah. So those will be kept looking more natural. Man, you can push that pretty hard and it's still like, oh, I mean... You know, it's not natural, but it looks, it's still, it doesn't look terrible, you know. And then all of the controls, like in, by the way, in the adjustments uh, of the HDR tool at the bottom, those are all global controls too. You will once again see that, you know, things like shadows or speculars or, you know, like the very brights are not affected as dramatically. Yeah. Cause I mean, man, you can push this really, really heavy warm and it's <laughs> still, you know, you still have whites. Yeah. Which that's great. Cause that saves you work <laughs> again. It's like, man, that's, that's really nice. Not to mention that, you know, the control point in the color wheel itself 
will also affect the image in the same way. So the uh, black point, white point remain pinched, so not as much impact on the shadows. So if you see under the car right now, it's still relatively black. Yeah. Whereas in the primaries uh, palette, that would have gone brown by now or red. Yeah. The primaries uh, palette is one of the tools not affected by oh. the white gamut. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I wanted to talk about is that this is how the HDR palette will work. Uh, with color management enabled but there is a setting inside of the project settings okay in which you can ask other palettes to behave in the way that the hdr palette is behaving and that is the color space aware grading tools so you okay. see how you have that option mm -hmm. what the hdr palette is doing that's a little bit unique to to that tool is it's automatically remapping its function to the tonal range of the media that you're working on so if you're working on raw media you know that means it's got like several stops worth of light and it's remapping itself to all of that data or if you're working with sdr that's of course a much narrower range but it will operate similarly as the hdr so it remaps itself to every single clip that you have wow. none of the other tools do that uh, by default unless that setting is enabled in the project settings gotcha. in which case the curves and the qualifier will pick up that behavior so you will notice that the curves maybe behave a little bit differently when you have color management enabled and you have that setting ticked okay Oh, yeah, it still pinches it at the top, right? Yeah, it is rolling off. In particular, it will be remapping the functionality of the curves to, again, the, the tonal range of the image. This is really fascinating stuff. I feel like this is definitely going to change the way that I work. And even though a lot of this is better implemented in Resolve 17, um, this kind of process isn't, isn't really new, right? I mean, they've kind of been doing work with this uh, with like ACEs and stuff for quite a while. Is that right? Yeah, the ACES is probably the more uh, standardized format uh, that are you that is used for uh, like professional deliverables and also in a lot of post houses. Uh, certain clients also demand that the projects be uh, delivered in ACES. But uh, Resolve Color Management, um, I have seen picking up more and more throughout the years. There's certainly room for it in professional workflows and absolutely room for like personal projects. This is really exciting. And thank you for, for walking us through it and just showing us how to, how to actually use this kind of stuff because, man, it, there's so much to learn. I mean, Resolve has gotten so complex over the years and there's so many different parts to it that it's kind of hard to keep up sometimes. And so it's really cool to kind of have a little bit of a deep dive here in how it works. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. That's it for this video, guys. Make sure to say thank you to Daria in the comments. Daria, this has been this awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time and hanging out with me. Yeah, absolutely. It's been my pleasure.